So we're live. Will I bother you if I come in out of this door once in a while? No, just don't close it all the way. Okay, that's right. All right, we're uh, watching Dr. David Aborn from UTC. He's working on uh, bird banding here, and we're going to just let people join as they find us. And we'll start officially at 2 o'clock here in just a few minutes. If you're watching, go ahead and comment for us. Let us know where you're watching from. And uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and queue them up, and we'll ask David once we get started. Dr. Aborn, what, what do you have there? It looks like a chickadee. Yeah, Carolina chickadee. It's a, a male. How do you know it's a male? Uh, it's uh, it doesn't have the uh, the brood patch on it. There it goes. <laughs> there goes a the chickadee. All right, if you just joined us, comment. Let us know where you're joining from. And we're going to wait just a minute to start the next bird until uh, we're we're officially past two o'clock. You guys, do me a favor. If you're on Facebook, share this out with somebody you think might enjoy watching bird banding and learning from Dr. David Aborn from UTC. If you're on YouTube, click subscribe so you'll get a notification next time we're live. Hey, Jessica, thanks for joining us. you haven't already joined the City Nature Challenge, it is underway. We started on the 24th and we go through the 27th. So go download, download iNaturalist, make a few observations, and head over to reflectionriding.org forward slash CNC to join the project. Another couple minutes until two o'clock, and we'll get started. Just a favor, share this out. If you just joined, comment. Let us know where you're joining from. Nice peaceful day here at Reflection Riding. We wish all of y'all could be here with us. It's about 60 degrees, light wind. All right, Dr. Aborn, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely, this is uh, Quite a treat for us to have a bird banding demonstration today. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Mark McKnight. I'm the president and CEO here at Reflection Riding Arbor and Nature Center. 
If you're not already familiar with the City Nature Challenge, go check out our other videos. We've been live a couple times in the last few days talking about uh, different aspects of the challenge. And I think we're up to, yeah, we're at 169 observers so far in the challenge, about 1,900 observations, 746, no, 745 species. So making some progress compared to the last update when we went live yesterday. Um, I'm really pleased to announce that we have Dr. David Aborn on with us, and here he is. You can see him. He's actually sitting out in the courtyard at uh, Reflection Riding right outside of my office in the little education uh, auditorium room that you may have been in if you've been to any of our public programming in the past. Dr. Aborn, can you introduce yourself and say hello to everybody? Hi, everyone. <laughs> so tell me, uh, I know you you bird banding obviously has been around for a long time. Can you tell us a little bit about where this concept came from and what is the object? What are you trying to do with bird banding? Well, the, uh, the first um, episode or, or incident of, of banding that I'm aware of was actually uh, John James Audubon. So he would tie little pieces of colored string to uh, on the, the legs of birds and kind of watch, watch what they did, watch where they, uh, they would go. Um, and then bird banding as a uh, sort of an, an organized scientific um, method for studying birds has been around um, since about the 1960s, the early, early to mid 1960s. Um, and since then, um, it's, uh, it's grown. There are about, uh, I think there are about 3,000 uh, permitted banders. So this is not something that just anyone can do. You have to have the, the skills and the training um, in order to be able to um, be uh, uh, given a, a banding permit. So there are only about 3,000 of us uh, in the United States. Um, and so uh, what happens is, um, I don't know if uh, folks might be able to, to see this, but these are bands of different sizes. Um, and each band has a unique number on it. And so by putting one of those on a bird, you're giving a bird essentially like a name tag, a unique uh, identifier. And so uh, if I or someone else uh, encounters a banded bird, then, you know, we have a, a record of where that bird was originally caught, how old it was. Um, how far it may have moved and, and so on. So there's a, there's a lot of information that, that we can get by banding birds. Mark, I believe that uh, Dr. Aborn has one more bird and we don't want it to get too stressed. So uh, let's go ahead and let him uh, put a band on this bird and he can explain a little bit about what he caught and uh, kind of show you the process. Okay, so what I've got here, let me uh, show you the full, full body here. So this is a, an Eastern Phoebe. It's a, a pretty common bird through this area. Uh, it's a flycatcher and in fact, it's the only flycatcher that's here uh, all year round. All the other flycatchers migrate down to the tropics during the, uh, during the fall and winter. And what I've done is I've got uh, special nets called mist nets set up uh, around the property. And these are nets that are difficult for the birds to see. And so as they're flying along, they hit the nets. Uh, and um, uh, about every 30 minutes or so, I go around and check the nets, and if any of them, uh, anything has been caught, I go ahead and take them out. And so here is the band. So uh, um, the uh, bands range in size from size X, which is for hummingbirds, uh, all the way up to uh, size 10 for some of the bigger hawks and owls and such. And so Phoebe's take a size zero, so they're, it's a pretty small uh, band. And so that's that. 
So the, the, the bands are just open. They're, they're, it's just sort of like a ring that's split. And so you open it up and you slip it around the bird's leg and then you just, you just close it and that's that. And you can see that the, the band moves and slides very easily. So it's not constricting the blood flow or anything like that. It's very, very lightweight. And so it doesn't uh, hurt or, or impede the bird at all. And so then uh, I go ahead and um, uh, check it uh, for its age. And so in Phoebe's, you can look at the, the wings. And if you see uh, sort of these uh, sort of dusky edges on, the, on the, uh, the feathers, it's a younger bird, but this doesn't. So this is an adult bird. And then I'll check its sex and see how that skin is very loose and wrinkly. That's yeah. a, a, a brood patch. And so female birds develop a brood patch so that when they're sitting on the eggs, there are these loose folds of warm skin covering the, uh, the eggs. So this tells me that it is a female. And so then I take a couple of measurements. So I'll measure the wing. So just from the bend of the wing to the longest feather. And then I'll get a weight on it. And so with the wing and the weight, I can calculate uh, sort of a, a body condition index, just like in humans, the, the body mass index, the, your, your um, weight divided by your height. Well, here we use the weight divided by the, uh, the wing cord. And so I can get an idea of this bird's uh, condition. And now this bird is ready to release. So you can see that the, the process doesn't take very long and the, the bird's, uh, you know, completely unharmed and, uh, and ready to go. So we'll go ahead and let this bird get back to her nest. And there she goes. That's great. So that, that particular bird was, uh, seemed fairly docile. Is that typical? Um, for the most part, there are some birds that are a little bit um, feistier. Cardinals tend to be pretty feisty. Uh, chickadees and titmice uh, tend to kind of raise a fuss. But yeah, a lot of birds, uh, you know, sparrows, warblers and such, they, um, they're, they're pretty mellow and they just, uh, you know, just kind of chill out while you're doing it and then, and then fly off. Awesome. Uh, I'm actually going to switch over. We have a, a few photos from earlier today, which will show people just kind of the really close up details of essentially what you just did. Um, so I'll, I'll walk you through it because I know you can't see my slides here. But uh, Actually, right I can uh, switch it around to where. Okay, perfect. I, I don't see the button on this orientation. I can just talk you through it. So, uh, David, I've got a picture up of you kind of setting up the mist net, and you you set up several different nets. Talk to me about how you picked your locations and, and kind of how this the actual nest or net setup worked. Well, you just try, you look for um, areas where you think uh, birds are going to be moving around, and that uh, you have a good uh, clear net lane. So the nets are uh, 12 meters long. So uh, 12 meters is, you know, like 38 feet or so. So you need a, you know, a, a stretch, uh, open stretch, you know, without any trees or other obstructions. And then you, uh, you set them up and, and, uh, see how they do. Like I say, the, um, the birds are flying along and, uh, they, the, the, uh, mesh, the nylon mesh is very fine and it's difficult for the birds to see. And as they're cruising along, they just they just hit the net and uh, and get caught. And they don't they don't get hurt in any way. Like I say, the material is very soft, so it doesn't uh, doesn't cut them or bruise them or anything like that. And so then I, I just go around and 
uh, check the nets and anything that's in them, I go ahead and just very carefully and methodically uh, take them out. I'm, I'm showing a cardinal now that you're you're working on getting out of the mist net. And here is uh, here's a, a close up, and you can see he's kind of a just kind of a mess of feathers, and it's clear that he's not really moving. And then you go in, um, and it looks like he's biting you. Does this one hurt? Yeah, cardinals hurt. They have they have very uh, sharp beaks and strong jaws because they they eat. You know, you can just look at the size of that beak and you know see that they they crack open uh, you know larger seeds, and so they need you know good strong jaw muscles. And so yeah, they 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 will hurt when they bite. <laughs> Uh, you can really see the skin pinched in between this particular cardinal. Uh, basically, just I guess a cotton sack. And what's what's the purpose of the bags that you put them in? Um, it just um, helps uh, keep them uh, keep them calm. You know, so the the bags they're cloth, they're breathable. So the birds can can breathe, but it's uh, you know dark and uh, you know warm. It just just helps calm them down a little bit. All right, and then you take it back. You, you had a little pop up table, actually the, the table that you're sitting at, um, that was out in the parking lot earlier when we were capturing the birds. And um, you essentially do. I'm just showing them kind of closer up view of what you did before. What's going on with the notebook where you have uh, you have a time and I guess you have the band numbers? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. What all do you put in the notebook? Oh, um, so I, I record the uh, um, the date, the time that the bird was captured. Um, it's uh, what spe uh, species it is, uh, its age, its sex, the uh, the wing length, and the uh, the weight. And of course, the band number. Awesome. Um, so we have a, a question from uh, Jessica. Are wooded or field wooded or field areas better for setting up the nets? Are wooded or field areas better for setting nets up? Um, it depends on what you're trying to catch. Um, you know, if you, if you're trying to catch uh, woodland species, then set them up in woods. If you're trying to catch grassland species, then set them up in in fields. You know, it's not. Uh, you know, it really is that that simple. Um, all right, I switched over to a uh, white-breasted nuthatch that we caught, and. I show a picture of you with a guidebook. Are you, is this guidebook telling you what to measure or, or how are you, what's the function here? Well, it's, it's a, a book uh, by a, a guy by the name of Peter Pyle. And it's, it's sort of the Banders Bible. And uh, what it does is for, for every bird species in North America, it, uh, it tells you all the characteristics uh, of the bird, uh, in particular, uh, things like uh, what size band the uh, the bird will take, uh, how to age the bird, how to sex it. Um, so it, it provides a lot of the the information that uh, that banders need to know uh, in order to uh, properly uh, uh, collect the information that uh, uh, that you need. Um, you know, it, it has a calendar, so it's, um, sometimes there are certain times of the year where you can't sex or age a bird, and so it lets you know, okay, during this time period, um, you know, you have to put it down as, like, say, age unknown or sex unknown. So, uh, so yes, um, it's very, very detailed, and uh, uh, so every every bird bander has a a, a pile guide. Okay, so my next slide is a photo of uh, bird bands, but they're gigantic. They're about the size of my thumb. Um, talk to me about the different types of bands. Well, as I was mentioning when I was talking about the uh, the Phoebe, um, the that type of a band 
is what's known as a butt end band. So as I said, it's just kind of a, a ring that's been split. And so you spread open the ring and then you close it until the two ends butt back together. But then there are some species uh, that are strong enough that they could, they could just pry that band uh, open again and it, would, and it would fall off. So things like hawks and owls, uh, some of the wading birds like uh, herons, and egrets or cranes. And so they take uh, a special band called a lock-on band. And so that was the, the type of band that, that you were holding. And you can see that it has a, a couple of tabs on it. And so you put the band around the bird's leg and then you fold one tab over the other and it locks it in place and makes it very difficult for, um, uh, for the bird to get it off. Very cool. Okay, I'm gonna go to a couple questions that we have coming in on Facebook. First, uh, Alden Hawkins asks if you've ever banded uh, pileated before um, yeah. and what is, their, what is their temperament like? Uh, yes, I have banded uh, several uh, pileated before and uh, they are they are very feisty. They, uh, you know, the whole time they're just sitting there uh, pounding on my hand, just wham, 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 and uh, uh, it was worth every scar. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, it, they are they are very very cool birds to to see close up, but they are they are very aggressive. So this is a, I, I would imagine that's the largest woodpecker probably in North America. Uh, yes, yeah. Now that uh, you know. Since the uh, the ivory billed woodpecker uh, is in all likelihood extinct, then uh, then yeah, the pileated it's the the largest. Very cool. If you have not seen that bird and you're watching this, go. You got to Google it. It's a giant bird. It's really fun to see in the in the woods around here. Um, here's one for you, and this is a this is a good point to discuss here. Uh, Stevie Davis asks if the data goes to a larger database after it's recorded. Can you talk us through that? Yes, so um, uh, every bander sends um, their information, all their data, to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Bird Banding Laboratory. And so they have a record of uh, every bird that's ever been banded since um, 1966. Um, and so, you know, that way, if... You know, as I was saying before, if anyone uh, finds uh, a banded bird, they can write the number down and go to the banding lab website and enter that number in, and it will sort sort through the uh, the database and give the the finder all the information. You know, of, of where the bird was banded, uh, when, by who, and so forth. And the bander, the original bander, will get um, a notification that that bird has been found, where it was found, when, was it alive or dead, and, and so on. Very cool. Do you have any idea uh, what the farthest is that a tagged bird has been recorded from, from where it was actually banded? Um, sure. I mean, a lot of our, our migratory species, like... Um, uh, you know, say uh, some of the uh, the shorebirds, like say um, red knot, is a is a shorebird of uh, that's uh, of of concern because its numbers have really been declining. They breed up in Alaska, and they winter down in uh, Patagonia at the tip of Argentina, and so birds that have been banded up in Alaska have been found down in Argentina and vice versa. Very cool. Um, do you have a specific focus for your research right now? I mean, I know you're really into understanding bird migration, but do you have specific birds that you're studying right now? Um, not any particular uh, species. My main project is uh, looking at whether or not our uh, urban green spaces are, are suitable places for birds during migration, because birds don't migrate in one big flight. They do it in a series of uh, legs, you know, so they'll, they'll fly a certain distance and then they'll stop and rest and refuel and so forth. Um, and so as our world becomes increasingly urbanized, 
Uh, I'm very interested in knowing whether these uh, urban spaces, like say our city parks or like reflection riding, uh, are, are uh, meeting the birds' needs during migration. And so by banding birds, uh, I'm able to look at things like um, how long uh, a bird might stay. So if an area is very suitable, um, you know, with lots of food, then they're going to fatten up and refuel very quickly and leave much sooner than an area that's not as high quality. Um, you know, do birds uh, return back to, uh, you know, the site every year and things of that nature? Makes sense. Um, I'm going to show a couple of things that are migrating through right now. Uh, I have up on the screen the Louisiana water thrush that was flying all around us. We didn't end up getting one in the nest, I mean in the net. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about the water thrush and when it comes through and where it's headed? Well, um, the water thrushes breed in this area. So that bird is probably here to stay for the summer. Um, and uh, Louisiana water thrush is one of our earliest migrants to come back in the spring. They start showing up, um, you know, in late March, early April. Um, and um, one of my uh, graduate students, uh, Elliot Burrs, is doing a really neat project uh, in conjunction with the, uh, the Tennessee River Gorge Trust, where he's putting these uh, little miniature tracking devices on Louisiana water thrushes. Uh, because it doesn't do much good to protect a bird up here where it's breeding if down in the tropics where it's wintering, uh, you know, the area is getting deforested or there's heavy pesticide use or something like that. And so he's putting these, um, been putting these tracking devices on uh, to look at where the, uh, the water thrushes are, um, uh, are going uh, because... Uh, here in Tennessee, water thrushes are doing fine. Louisiana water thrush populations are doing very well. But in other parts of the country, uh, the Louisiana water thrush is declining. And so he's interested in, in knowing, well, um, is, that, you know, is that related to, uh, say, the migration route that they're taking or the specific areas where they're, uh, they're wintering? So... I really enjoyed working with Elliot and all the all the folks at Tennessee River Gorge Trust. We actually, um, Rick, who's the executive director over there, he and I took a walk out around our um, boardwalk area, and we saw a pair that were calling back and forth to each other, and they were uh, really kind of talking talking up a storm. And he said, "Hey, we should throw you into this project and let um, let's try to." capture one here and place this tracker on it. And they came back, I think, I think they came back three times and we never found that bird again. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to watch the science actually unfolding and, and you never know if you're gonna get your bird or not. Um, I'm gonna share actually a photo. This is, this is the tracker that you're talking about. And it looks like it has a, a little battery on the left and there's kind of some circuits on the right. Um, tell me how this thing, functions? Um, yeah, it's what's known as a um, light level geolocator is the, is the full name of it. And uh, that, that round structure there is, a, um, is the battery. Uh, and then that little square in there in the middle is the, um, the light sensor. And the, uh, the units that Elliot is putting on, uh, the light sensor is actually on uh, a, little, a little stalk just so that it's, um, it's a little more elevated and is more likely to uh, receive sunlight. And so what it does is it uses the, uh, the day length. So as a, as a bird is, is migrating, let's say it's migrating from here down south, it's heading towards the equator. And so the days get longer. Um, and so uh, it uses the change in day length to calculate uh, the latitude that the bird is at. And then uh, as it migrates, uh, let, again, let's say south, the earth is getting wider. 
And so the arc of the sun across the sky is getting longer, uh, what's known as the azimuth. And so it uses the azimuth to calculate the longitude. And so you can get uh, the bird's location uh, within about 60 miles. So, you know, you can't, you can't use it to pinpoint, you know, okay, it's, it, you know, it's here at reflection riding, but you could, uh, you, you know, you could tell, okay, it's in the Chattanooga area. Okay. And so one of the main drawbacks of bird banding is that you have to recapture the bird to get any kind of data. And then you're really just getting one point of data. How, how much, uh, well, you still have to recapture with this device though, right? Yes. Yeah. It, <clears throat> It's a, um, it's not a transmitter. It's actually a, a miniature data logger. So it, it's recording the data, but in order to retrieve the data, you actually have to get the unit back and download uh, that information. So, so yeah, you, you know, uh, and actually Elliot's had pretty good success with the, uh, the water thrushes. He's getting, um, I think about 30 or 40% of the units back, which is actually, actually oh, wow. pretty good. Yeah, that's more than I would expect. That's yeah, uh, so there, there have been some other species where they put these um, geolocators on and, you know, they're only getting 5% uh, of the units back. Um, I'm going to play a couple more photos or show a couple more photos. These are ones that Corey took while I was gone, actually. Um, this one is a yellow rumped warbler that's kind of hanging upside down in the net. And then uh, this is a beautiful uh, blue bird. This is an indigo bunting. Yeah, indigo bunting. Beautiful bird there. Um, was that a, that's a male? Yes, the, the females will be uh, all brown. And uh, that, so I think cardinals are the, one of those uh, species that everybody knows around here and, and obviously the bright red is the male and then there's a sort of uh, more subdued female. Why would you have that? It's called sexual dimorphism when they look different. What's the purpose of that? Um, well, um, the males want the want to be noticed, uh, you know, and they're they're competing for the the females. They're, so they're competing. They, they want the uh, given female to choose them as their mate. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's why, you know, we have, you know, a lot of birds have those um, uh, complex songs and the bright colors uh, because it's what females find uh, attractive. Uh, the females are duller colored uh, because they need to be more uh, cryptic, more inconspicuous so that, you um, when they're sitting on the nest, predators, it's harder for predators to, to find them on the nest. Gotcha. Um, if anybody has questions, go ahead and type them in in the comments. We're live on Facebook and YouTube. If you're on YouTube, click over uh, somewhere, to maybe up there, maybe up there on your screen, you should see a subscribe button. Subscribe so you don't miss out the next time we go live. And if you're on Facebook, uh, make sure you follow us. You probably already do. We're live with Dr. David Aborn from UTC. So David, one of the things that we have done a few times now is a Sandhill Crane migration tour where we start here at the grounds for reflection riding. We show the audience, uh, well, usually kind of talk a little bit about the migration, but we show them up, up close and personal the two captive birds that we have here. And then we carpool out and about, oh, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes from here at the Hawassi Wildlife Refuge, there can be hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of cranes. And can you talk to us a little bit about the Sandhill crane migration and uh, your studies with that? Obviously they're not here right now. They come come through in the winter. Well, the, uh, the Sandhill cranes that we get coming through here are, uh, uh, they breed up in the Great Lakes area. So, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Ontario. Uh, and then they're migrating down to uh, Florida. And uh, at Hiawassee, uh, back in 
I guess it was the early 90s or so, uh, they started planting corn out there to uh, attract waterfowl because it's a, a waterfowl hunting refuge and uh, or management area. And uh, cranes love corn. And so as they were as they were migrating through, you know, they, they looked down and they, they saw this food and, the, you know, they've got the, the water and the mud flats for roosting. And so they started uh, stopping at Hiawassee in bigger and bigger numbers on their way to Florida. And uh, conditions are so good and our winters are generally uh, pretty mild so that a lot of birds uh, are now just spending the entire winter at Hiawassee rather than going all the way down to Florida. Uh, so they start arriving uh, generally around Thanksgiving uh, and their numbers build and peak in early January. And then in February, they start heading back north uh, to breed. And, you know, generally by early March, maybe sometimes mid-March, they're, they're all gone. But it's it's really um, something to see if you, if you get the chance, and um, uh, there's a festival every year, Sandhill Crane and uh, Cherokee Indian Heritage uh, Festival that's held um, at uh, Birchwood, at the uh, the Birchwood Community Center, which is uh, just down the road from the uh, the refuge, and so there are speakers and exhibits, and they run buses. Uh, from the uh, the community center out to the refuge, and um, there are folks from the Tennessee Ornithological Society out there with um, a telescope, so you can get really good looks at the cranes and other birds, and, and are there to answer questions. And uh, it's a it's a good time. And if folks haven't been, they should uh, they should go ahead and, and uh, plan on going next year. Yeah, I highly recommend that. So if you if you haven't already signed up for our email newsletter, do that. We always announce it, uh, a few times and try to make it available to people. Um, the festival is really fun. I've been to the festival before, uh, but it's it's kind of cool to be able to see the cranes face to face in our location too. So once we get open again, come see the cranes. And uh, I'm actually going to switch over. I wanted to check in on the project that we have going for the City Nature Challenge. We are in the middle of the challenge. It started on April 24th and runs through April the 27th. It ends at, I guess, 11.59 and 59 seconds or whatever, <laughs> uh, right before midnight. And we have 171 observers so far, which is pretty cool. Almost 2,000 observations. It'll be 2,000 by the time I, I get the chance to go home and upload all the pictures I took while we were waiting on birds today. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out is if you're interested in specific um, Specific things like birds, or uh, maybe you're a plant guy, you can actually go over to the stats. And if you check out the stats, you'll see the total number of observations. Looks like we have uh, 672 that are research grade, which means that those are actually going to be useful to science. They go up to a, a global citizen science network um, and can be useful for people studying migration or studying how perhaps ranges are changing. Looks like we have 1,100 that need ID, so we need your help. If you're um, an expert in anything in particular or you're a naturalist that can knock off some of the um, those identifications for us, that is helpful. If you actually click this, it'll take you to just the observations that need ID, which is cool as well. And if you look at the number of species that people are finding, 63% uh, plants, which is no surprise um, because it's kind of the baseline. That's where you're going to find most of the uh, species diversity. 170 Mark, species. Yeah. Uh, David, we need to go out and check the net. So I'm going to carry the phone with me. And uh, if we uh, have anything in the net, we'll, we'll show it to people. And it, uh, regardless, we'll get to kind of see what, the way the nets are set up. Yeah, that sounds perfect. We'll check back in with you. I'm going to meet you guys out and uh, we'll check back in with you when you get to the nets. Um, so here we have uh, the plant species, insects. I was going to try to find birds in here. Let's see. So birds, we have 50 species of birds right now. Let's see what we have in here. Um, so we have a few that are showing up as casual and they don't have a photo. What that means is that somebody has, has ID'd the bird themselves. They see it, but 
they either didn't get a photo or uh, a, a recording, and that's fine. We actually had a big discussion about the City Nature Challenge with all the global organizers, and we decided that we were going to accept any kind of observation, whether or not you could get uh, a good photo or, or audio. Now, it's not as useful in terms of science, but it is interesting to see what people are seeing out there. So we've got a red-bellied uh, eastern bluebird. I saw a few of those today as well. We do have an indigo bunting. Unfortunately, this one looks like it might be a, a window strike or something. This one is dead. That's sad to see. Um, one of the things that you can do if you do find something, uh, especially with a bird like this that's hit a window, put a comment in there that it's hit a window. Sometimes uh, researchers will come on and they'll they'll actually look through. You can also annotate that that is dead. There's an annotation for living and dead. You can annotate it and I'll actually, I'll go ahead and do that. So I'll show you how to do that. So if you're on, uh, one thing you'll notice too, if you're used to using the app, when you're on desktop, there's a lot more that you can do. I'm going to roll down to this annotation section and you see life stage. This looks like an adult. So I'm going to say adult, alive or dead, and it is dead. Um, there's also observation fields. And I believe there's an observation field for, yeah, there is for found dead. Uh, there's flew into window. So if you know that a bird flew into window and you're standing there next to the window, that's helpful. I actually take a picture of the window as well. I was talking with Dr. Aborn earlier today. We've been out here since about eight o'clock uh, working on this. And he said that he's actually working with the UTC system to try to get a bird friendly policy in place so that they can do some things to mitigate how many birds are hitting windows, which I would love to see happen. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? We've got great blue herons, great one around this area. You can see the hooded warbler and the scarlet tanager that I saw earlier today. And I actually just shot, um, this is something I'll do a lot in the field when I just wanna go ahead and capture it. Um, it's actually just a, an iPhone photo of my um, mirrorless camera. My camera doesn't have GPS, and so when I shoot a an iPhone photo of the screen, that captures the date and time. And those are two critical components. You have to have a, a, a date when it was observed, and you have to have a location for it to be useful to ultimately become research grade at some point. Now, I will go back in once I get a chance to download all this stuff to my camera, and I will uh, I'll go back and upload the high-res photos. So it'll look a little better. I'm going to check in with Corey and see if he can tell us what they're finding. Hey, Corey, can you hear me? Yeah. So what um, are you guys finding out there in the field right now? Anything? Well, we checked the first net, and it was all clear. So we're uh, about to check the second net. Uh, there are five nets up, so we'll be uh, we'll be kind of walking from net to net and seeing if anything's in here. Cool. Um, we can I'm go ahead and show you one of the nets here. Okay. I don't know if you can even see it in the camera. But it's well, this really is one of the, fine. <laughs> you really can't see it. And it's funny because this is one of the things that I, I was, I came looking for you guys after I had been off in a different direction. And I almost walked into that net because you really, you can't see it. It's amazing. And so when the bird is flying along, it hits the net. And you can see that, that these, it's sort of made up with a series of panels, and those panels then form pockets. And so the bird sits in that pocket, and I come along and, and take it out. Very cool. Yeah, we're, we're going to go ahead and walk down to the next site. So if you want to mute us again, we'll, we'll uh, be back with you in a minute. Okay, I'll check in just a sec. All right, I'm gonna actually switch screens here real quick. Switch back to sharing the screen. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and just drop them into the comments and we'll ask Dr. Dave Warren when we get him back. Um, wanted to show you guys some of the other observations that I'm getting. I'm stuck on this tab. Hold on just a sec. Okay. All right. So he, here I've narrowed down to 
all the birds and I'm going to walk you back through that because I think you couldn't see my other tab. This is an indigo bunting. It looks like it was found dead. And so I'm going to roll down to the annotations and you'll see that I've, I've annotated that the life stage is adult and that it is dead. Um, there are observation fields that I was talking about and you can see that there's flu into window. Um, there's also banded, which is a cool one for uh, what we're talking about. You can mark if it was banded. A lot of times you can get a photo and you can see that it was banded. Now that's not useful in terms of uh, that there's almost no chance that you're going to be able to get a photo where you can actually read the numbers on the band and, and make a you know, report that as an observation. But it is cool anyways to know that they're banded. Let's pop back out and see what else people are finding out there in the greater Chattanooga region. Brown Thrasher. Uh, brown headed nuthatch. That's cool. A feeder bird here from Dr. Miller. Oh, this was a fun one. So this is from Tom. Tom B found a crow that was stealing eggs. <laughs> and I actually, I, I noticed that that one says stealing a second egg. So this observation right before it looks like another one where he was stealing an egg out of the nest. Corey, I think I hear the sandhill cranes. <laughs> Yes, uh, they're they're calling, and we're down here at the last net. It appears that uh, we have not captured anything this round, so we're going to be headed back up. But uh, yeah, the sandhill cranes have been calling, and it's a beautiful day to be out in nature. Everyone needs to go out and take some pictures and upload them. Agreed. Beautiful, beautiful day. So. Uh, switching back, I'm going to go really quickly through what you would do. I'm actually on desktop. Uh, most of the observations I see coming in are coming in on iPhone or Android app for iNaturalist, but there is a lot more you can do with your observations. If you upload them on the desktop, you can uh, add those annotations that I was talking about. Um, I was going to see if I can find one that I could actually help. ID. Yeah, here's a downy woodpecker. Let's check this out. So this is what your observation will look like before anybody else comes in and helps you with it. And then, so this is one where actually Adventure James says it's genus Dryobates, or I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it. And then um, Nature Light says, yeah, it's a downy woodpecker. Um, if I agreed with this, then it would become research grade because more than two thirds believe that it is a downy woodpecker. Um, I can also annotate life stage again, alive or dead. I know it's alive. <laughs> um, and then sex, if I'm able to determine that. Um, one thing that's cool on here too is it shows you the top identifiers. So one of the things you could do is you could actually, if you weren't sure, you could actually go in here and comment and say at Greg Lassley. Uh, what do you think? Can you help us with this ID? And then when I hit done and make that comment, Greg Lastly will actually see a, um, a little ding here on this, uh, this little status thing here. And it'll say, hey, uh, somebody mentioned you in a comment. So kind of like a lot of social networks, you can actually at tag people. And it's a pretty cool thing. And you'll you definitely get to a point where if you've done this for a while, you can see you'll know the right person to reach out to to help with an ID, which is pretty cool. Going back to the challenge. Um, one thing you can do, too, is follow us. If you join, you can instead of saying members, this would say join if you were logged in and you weren't following us yet. And that'll uh, allow you to get updates so you can see what people are observing. And there actually is a journal as well. I've been posting here and there from this. Um, I've got a few tips and tricks in here. For example, uh, we're all kind of stuck at home for the most part during this time. So if you're at home and you don't want to upload a ton of uh, 
a ton of observations right around your house, just clustered around your house, you can actually obscure. And so in this video, it'll show you how to obscure, which is pretty cool. Corey, are you guys back into Wi-Fi range? Yeah, we're, we're back. Okay. Um, I think uh, I'm going to make one last call for comments, questions, see if anybody has any questions of Dr. Aborn. If not, I think we're – we're about to wrap it up and then we can get back out in the field and make some observations. Dr. Aborn, thanks so much for coming today. I really appreciate your time and uh, I look forward to seeing what else you find. Well, thank you for, uh, for inviting me. I've enjoyed it. Corey, uh, Corey Hagen, our director of education is in the background. He's the one actually uh, holding my phone. <laughs> Um, and is recording Dr. Aborn. Corey, thanks for Hi, your time. Everybody. Thank you so much for uh, taking part in this and uh, follow us on Facebook so you'll know when our next live broadcast is going to be. Um, I'm sure that we'll be doing one on Monday to kind of give you updates on where we stand in the City Nature Challenge and uh, show you some of the neat observations that have been taken so far. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a good day. I'm going to switch back real quick, um, show you guys. I was showing you the journal entries there. There's some good videos. I've also linked some of the other live streams that we had. But please go check out inaturalist.org. Follow the project so you can get updates. Uh, if you're in the 16 county region surrounding Chattanooga, which is shown here in this map of observations, this is the 16 county region that the uh, Thrive Regional Partnership has defined as kind of the greater Chattanooga region. So we picked that area, as you can tell, uh, and probably uh, in large part because we are all collectively at home right now. Most of the observations are coming in from the population centers, uh, definitely heavily concentrated here in Chattanooga. And there's a little cluster up in Cleveland. But uh, hopefully next year we'll all be able to get out on the road and we can go explore, especially some of this North Alabama area that doesn't have a lot coming in right now. There's some great birding down there, uh, all kinds of biodiversity. There's some great remnant grasslands as well. And uh, if you didn't see the presentation that we did with Zach Erick from Southeastern Grasslands Initiative, uh, he and I are going to go on a few trips in that area. And so we'll, we'll plan to take some people out with us here once we're able to do that. But thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Head on over to reflectionwriting.org and hit subscribe. Give us a like. Share this with somebody. It'll be all recorded and it'll go onto our YouTube channel and be available on Facebook as soon as we hang up. So thanks again. Have a great day.